Imagine if you could take all of the worst dregs of the internet, from the fetid swamps of Aitken to the bloated septic tank that is the dark web, and formed them into a crude approximation of a human being. That human-like shit golem would be Nathan Larson, proud pedophile, misogynist, white supremacist, and failed political candidate. Let's get into it. Hi folks, and welcome back to my channel. To my subscribers and patrons, thank you so much for spending time with me. You are the reason I have this channel. And if you're new here, my name is Delaney and I'm a true crime writer and big time murder nerd. On this channel, I like to talk about some of the worst human beings on the planet. And I tend to cuss a lot. So if you're into that sort of thing, go ahead and subscribe. If not, that's cool. You do you. But now let's get into the case of Nathan Daniel Larson. And while he didn't murder anybody that we know of, his crimes are so hateful, I had to cover them anyway. And so I need to give a content warning here. We'll be discussing SA and child SA. I'm not going to get graphic, but if it's still something you don't want to deal with, I understand. I'll catch you next time. On December 14th, 2020, a 12-year-old girl we'll call Jane went missing from her Fresno, California home. That morning, her parents discovered her gone from her bed and reported it to the police immediately. At first, the police didn't have much to go on. Just some grainy surveillance footage of a red pickup truck pulling up to her home and then leaving a minute later. But when they started questioning her friends, they discovered that she'd been communicating online with an older man for several weeks prior to her disappearance. Jane had even shared her new friend's Wikipedia page with them. The man was 40-year-old Nathan Larson, a former political candidate from Catlett, Virginia. Now, before we get into Nathan Larson's background, I want to give a big shout out to the YouTuber Belle DeMacy, who got most of this information from her own research, including interviewing Larson himself. I'll put a link to her channel in the description. I also got a lot of information from his own website. Anyway... Larson was born in 1980 in Charlottesville, Virginia, yeah, that Charlottesville, into what seemed to be a stable, normal household. However, his father, Arthur, couldn't seem to hold down a job, and so his mother, Dottie, was the primary breadwinner. It seems that Larson had mental health issues early on. In his online memoir, he describes being bullied by other kids in school for his awkwardness, although he was involved in Future Farmers of America and Future Business Leaders of America. He writes that he was put on Percocet in the ninth grade after breaking his arm and that he went on to abuse the drug after that. Around that same time, his mother took him to a psychiatrist for his depression and he was prescribed Paxil, though he refused to do any counseling. He says that Paxil induced a manic state in him and that under its influence, he'd used a hatchet to destroy a bunch of stuff in his house and even threatened to kill his mother, saying he wouldn't feel any guilt about it. After that, they began weaning him off of it, but his erratic behavior continued. In one notable incident, he brought a super soaker filled with urine to school and shot it at another student. He was taken to the principal's office and suspended. Larson's reaction to this was to run out of the school. The school police officer ran after him and Larson pulled a knife on him. Needless to say, he was chased down and arrested. He was charged with a felony count of attempting to maliciously wound an officer as well as several related misdemeanor charges. His father went to bat for him, blaming the Paxil for his son's behavior, so Larson was allowed to plead down the felony charge to a misdemeanor. And since he was going to be suspended from school for the rest of the year, he just dropped out. After that, he got his GED and his dad arranged for him to enroll in community college, whatever that means, where he says he had his first real relationship, which only lasted a few weeks. His grades at first were good, but they began dropping as his mental health declined. One day, he stole $100 out of the register at the McDonald's where he was working with the intent to buy a gun to commit the S-word. 
though he says he changed his mind on his way home. When they discovered the theft, McDonald's called his father, and his father had him committed to a mental hospital. After he got out, he went back to college. He says an economics class changed his life forever because it turned him on to libertarianism. And in fact, he ran for student congress on a platform of decriminalizing cannabis and won. But in the spring of 2003, he was arrested again, this time for using a computer to harass a woman named Sarah. His parents once again bailed him out. You might be noticing a pattern. Anyway, in 2008, after graduating with a bachelor's in management, he ran for Virginia State Congress as an anarcho-capitalist who advocated auctioning off all the nation's infrastructure and dissolving all levels of government. He was endorsed by the Libertarian Party and was even elected as a delegate to the National Libertarian Convention. But, shockingly, he failed to win the election. As his campaign progressed and it became clear that he wasn't going to win, he started fantasizing about truck bombing the government, a la Timothy McVeigh, and he was talking about it on various internet forums. That caught the attention of the FBI. He said they approached his mother and told her that they had enough evidence to arrest him for terrorism, but that she could avoid that by going to a county magistrate and getting an emergency detention order to commit him to a mental hospital. So, as usual, his parents did whatever was needed to protect him. He was detained by police and escorted to a psychiatric hospital again. There, he says he was diagnosed with delusional disorder. But somehow he had been able to choose his committal as voluntary, specifically so he wouldn't lose his rights to own a firearm. So, before any other tests could be done, he chose to leave. Now, he says he came to believe that a mass terrorist attack wasn't the way to go. Instead, he thought it would be better to assassinate a high-ranking government official, namely Senator Robert Byrd. He wrote a long screed about why he was doing it, accusing the government of being an organized crime cartel, demanding it be abolished, and an anarcho-capitalist system put in place. You know, the usual right-wing sovereign citizen bat shittery. He even enrolled in an NRA firearms class to learn how to handle a gun, but his mother burst into the classroom and informed the teacher that he had a, quote, plan and that she was worried about him. Notably, she didn't say what that plan was. So the instructor, thinking he was S-word title, threw him out of the class, and Larson gave up his plan to assassinate Senator Byrd. Instead, he just switched gears. In December 2008, he wrote an email to the Secret Service threatening to kill the president for, quote, armed robbery. Now, it's unclear if his threat was against the sitting president, George W. Bush, or the then president-elect, Barack Obama. But considering his white supremacist views, I think we can probably guess who he meant. In his rambling, off-the-rails email, he again wrote about using assassinations to overthrow the United States government by force so that an anarcho-capitalist system could take its place. He then finishes it up by saying, I hope this essay has convinced you of the merits of this idea, and then lists several books that they should read. And because he was so smart, he signed it with his real name and address. Obviously, he was arrested immediately. His public defender insisted on having him mentally evaluated, again. This time, he was diagnosed with a personality disorder not specified, with paranoid, antisocial, and narcissistic features. His mother and sister wrote statements to the court swearing he was not a violent person. Apparently, they had forgotten about that whole hatchet incident, and since his previous charge for attempting to injure a police officer had been pled down to a misdemeanor in juvenile court, he appeared to have a clean record. Anyway, he eventually pled guilty and was sentenced to 16 months in prison and three years of supervised parole. He was also required to participate in mental health treatment, which he called a waste of taxpayer dollars because, as he put it, he didn't have a mental disorder. Okay, buddy. Anyway, while he was in prison, he attempted to S-word himself by refusing to eat, but he was eventually force-fed. He was released after 14 months, but because he refused, in writing, to comply with his parole conditions, he was arrested again in 2012 and sent back in. 
Apparently, this is around the time when his pedophilic tendencies started emerging because when he was released in December of 2012, he was ordered to participate in sex offender treatment to have spyware installed on his computer that he not have any contact with children without adult supervision, that he not access P word of any kind and not to work or volunteer in any positions involving children. Of course, he posted a manifesto about it where he makes himself out to be the victim of the evil tyrannical government. Around 2013, he met a trans man named Finn on an S word forum. Finn was still living as a woman at that time and the two started an online relationship. That spring, Finn moved in with Larson and his parents and they were married in late April, but it didn't last long, 75 days to be exact. Apparently, Finn, who was at the time pregnant, went to Larson's mom to get her to mediate between them on the subject of Nathan having sex with their child. That was the last straw for him. He kicked Finn out. But this also shows that Dottie knew what her son was about. In fact, Larson says when he emailed Finn to apologize for essaying them, Dottie told him not to because it could expose him to legal consequences. Anyway, in 2015, Finn filed for divorce and petitioned the court for a restraining order against him. In a sworn statement, they alleged that Larson was abusive and had essayed them repeatedly during the marriage. In a legal document waiving parental support, Finn wrote, During our relationship, he was severely emotionally and sexually abusive towards me. He stated multiple times that he wanted to have sex with a child. He raped me until I got pregnant and stated his intention was to have sex with my child after she was born. Larson would later openly admit to these allegations. Now, Finn had left him while they were still pregnant and then tried to keep their daughter hidden from him in order to protect her. However, Finn struggled with PTSD and not long after they left Larson in June, 2015, they committed the S word. Their daughter was taken into custody by Child Protective Services but Larson went to court to try and get custody of her. For whatever reason, he seemed to think that the custody trial was the perfect public forum on the rights of files. He even admitted to the jury that he had sexual feelings for children and couldn't guarantee he wouldn't have sex with his own daughter. Shockingly, the jury refused to grant him custody and instead allowed the girl to live with Finn's parents. Anyway, during this time, Larson was becoming more and more involved in extremist online websites and message boards. At one point, he ran multiple websites and message boards aimed at files, misogynists, and incels, including rapey.co, incels.me, and incelocalypse.today. These domain names, by the way, were paid for by his mother. On these sites, he posted about how Hitler was a white supremacist hero and how he admired incel mass murderer Elliot Roger. But that's not even the worst of it. He would also post things like feminism is the problem, rape is the answer, and fantasies about essaying his own daughter. He posted that he wanted to get a woman pregnant so he could have sex with the child and would refer to children as F-toys. One of his sites had a secret members-only forum for sharing child pee. It was in 2017 when Belle DeMazy was made aware of Rapey.co, one of Larson's many websites where members discussed SA and pedophilia fantasies, as well as instructions on how to actually commit these crimes and get away with them. DeMazy made it her mission to out Larson as the administrator and to have the site removed. It was eventually taken down but he just rebooted it under a new name. That same year, possibly thanks to DeMazy, he was investigated by two different agencies for a possible child P, but the cases were closed because it was determined that his posts and websites were, quote, protected First Amendment speech. The following year, 2018, this very smart and mentally stable man ran for U.S. Congress. His platform mirrored the hateful shit he was posting online. He supported, quote, benevolent white supremacy and wanted to repeal women's right to vote and the Violence Against Women Act, stating that women should be treated as property. He also advocated for legalizing incestuous marriages, child pee, and pedophilia. 
Here's him being interviewed during his campaign. Nathan Larson told me he wants to, quote, restore liberty and make incest legal. What about sexual relations with your own children? Like, I, I would favor, like, le legalizing incest. Why is that? Just because uh, personal freedom. What about a, the children's rights? Oh. Wouldn't that be rape to have sex with a child? Uh, well, like, like with girls, I mean, I just believe that it should be for fathers to make those decisions. And you don't find anything wrong with that? I mean, it's not for me to intrude on another family and tell them what they should do. Wouldn't that be really dangerous for children? I don't see how we know that. Like, Children are human beings. They're not property. What about their protection? Oh, uh, the law doesn't treat them as uh, having the full rights of adults. Nathan Larson also told me he doesn't think wives should be allowed to accuse their husbands of rape. Now, while normal humans find this man reprehensible, the scumbags on his sites worshipped him. He was almost like their cult leader. Anyway, after it was discovered that his campaign website shared an IP address with the pedophile and incel sites, his domain host terminated them. Having failed to get elected again and now outed on national news for his disgusting views, Larson faded from the public eye. But not from his internet file bubble. He was still working to make his sick fantasies come to life. DeMaisy, through her research, found that up through 2020, Larson was still active on these sites and was communicating with multiple girls online and soliciting pornographic images from them. One of these girls was Jane in Fresno. Looking through Jane's digital records, detectives uncovered information that suggested Larson might be taking her to the Fresno airport in order to fly with her back to his home in Virginia. And I just want to note that the tickets were paid for with his mom's credit card. Anyway, at that point, the Central California Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force took over the investigation. With the help of the Fresno Airport Police and the Department of Homeland Security, Larson was arrested during a layover in Denver on December 14, 2020. He was there with Jane, who was wearing a wig. She was reported to be unharmed, though it was later revealed that Larson had SA'd her while they were still in Fresno. She would later say Larson had instructed her to wear the wig and pretend to have a disability, making her unable to talk. Four days later, Homeland Security, along with some other law enforcement agencies, raided his home, where he lived in a dilapidated shed and a tent in the woods behind his parents' house. During the raid, his father was also arrested for assaulting a Homeland Security agent. Now, Nathan Larson was facing felony charges of kidnapping, child abduction, soliciting child P from a minor, and meeting a child for the intention of sex along with a misdemeanor charge of harboring a minor. He pled not guilty and, like every narcissist ever, demanded to represent himself. However, in June 2021, he was ordered to undergo yet another psychiatric evaluation. Because, yeah. Anyway, based on the sophisticated grooming methods he'd used on Jane, investigators suspected that she wasn't his only victim. Sure enough, soon after his arrest, several more young women came forward, alleging Larson had victimized them as well. However, he never stood trial. On September 18, 2022, he died in custody at an Arizona medical facility. The Arizona ME still hasn't released a cause of death, but based on letters that he allegedly sent to a friend, which were posted on another <laughs> forum, he committed the S-word by starving himself. So, that was disgusting. Now we all need to bleach our brains. But at least it had a happy ending. Now, I'm not advocating for what Nathan Larson did to himself, but I'm sure not going to shed any tears about it either. So, what do you think about this case? Let me know in the comments. Till next time, darklings.